Hey, this is Candia Raquel. I am the host of the Sensual Sessions podcast, the place to explore sensing pleasures through your senses and moving in a way that is completely free from inhibition and full of self-expression. If you're new, please get yourself subscribed to get these episodes delivered on your inbox every week at www.centrodepoder.com, which is www.centrodepoder.com. And today we have a very special guest. This is Margaret Kay. She's from Australia and she's a Feldenkrais Method practitioner, also an assistant trainer and she has shared with us already two wonderful episodes on sensitivity and sensuality with a special focus on touch so i recommend you go watch and listen them along this one that is the the crowning of this wondrous trilogy so welcome margaret very happy to have you here again Yes, what fun. Thank you for having me again. Yes. So you worked with actors and I'm I'm curious about what you did with them and how you get to find out about the story about Venus and Adonis, the, the play from, from <laughs> okay. here. Um, okay, so um, I've worked for many, many years with, with uh, actors and all kinds of performers, and particularly actors, um, and the exploration is about, as it is with most people, but because actors' uh, job is to tra be transformative and transform themselves into a character um, that is another character but it's also themselves so the idea is then to explore different observations of how they habitually seek to represent themselves and how they represent um, the character And sometimes, um, so there's, there's two things. So they may have habitual ways of behaving for themselves. Um, they, so for example, one actor came to me, said, I'm about to do an audition. Something's not right. What's happening? And I said, do the, do the audition for me. And she was like, blah, 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 blah. And she never looked over there. It was her habit just to look here. But as a performer, <clears throat> you need to have the scope of the whole audience. So it was just that for her that made the difference. She got the position, by the way. Wow. And um, as as I like to say that the and they say this is the instrument here. This is how we perform. Like a musician, they have an instrument, but this is the instrument that works with the instrument. With an actor, they don't have an actual instrument. They are the instrument. Yes. And I work with um, a, a dear uh, colleague slash friend now who is a Shakespeare actor. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and uh, we've, we've talked for many years about putting some... Feldenkrais and formative thing together with him as the Shakespeare actor slash director and me as the Feldenkrais actor. So we've been doing that for a while. It's called The Aware Actor. And he was in a play um, called Venus and Adonis, which is a Shakespeare play. And um, uh, what was really was fascinating was actually the story of, of William Shakespeare interspersed with uh, different performances of his 
plays, but not his plays, I beg your pardon, his sonnets. And one of and obviously um one of them was about um Venus Adonis. And I'm just gonna read this to you because I did a little search. I'm just gonna read something that I found about um yes. what what fascinated me was was um um that in in the sonnet or the, the the history of Venus and Adonis is that it was Venus the goddess of love who was chasing Adonis and this was contrary to how we often perceive people's interactions in a heterosexual context um, of the man chasing the woman it was her that was the dynamic one and this is what I found on the internet just a little phrase it says Venus is a Roman goddess whose functions encompassed love, beauty, desire, sex, fertility, prosperity and victory. Contrary to diminishment of female rights to independently have agency over their own sexuality. In other words, women do have rights over their own sensuality slash sexuality. Yes. And pleasure. So she was the she was the one seeking. <clears throat> so it's not about women having less rights, it's about women having equal rights or equal rights in some context. So that was very interesting. And and that's that's another aspect which is that we when we talk about sensuality often we think and I tell people oh, I'm doing a podcast on sensuality. They go, "Oh, as if it's sexuality." But sensuality is a component of sexuality. Sensuality has many broad aspects, and just sexuality. Yes. <clears throat> and one of those, for example, is um, okay. So obviously, we've talked before about all the various senses. But um, one of those is uh, our interaction with other humans and how that is um, given, how we use our instrument, if you like, and how it's perceived. There are cultural norms around that. Um, and so, and if you like, stereotypes around that. So what are some of the stereotypes? Well, um, there's, so I, I'm reading you, there's body language. And in, in body language, I'm reading somebody, but they're also reading me. So I'm trying to convey something through my body language. So if I'm going like this while you're talking to me, you'll be wondering why. I'm not engaging with you. Or if I'm going like this, you'll think, oh, a bit of attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, the, the tradition in um, uh, the representation of female as being sexy is uh, this position. where we have the chin over the shoulder and we're twisting our trunk. And if we were standing, I'd be putting my weight on one leg compared to the other. So that's right. And you're also doing something with your mouth when you do that. <laughs> and um, uh, the, that position in standing is called contrapposto. So it's a traditional um, position for artists to use like Michelangelo. So there's the statue of David. He's doing contrapposto, but that's not common these days. Men don't do that these days. Not at all. That's not how men represent their being mm. hot position. They don't do that, or certainly some configurations of what men want to, how what they want to represent themselves. We'll say heterosexual men, let's say. <clears throat> well, do that to look sexy, they'll be like, 
broadening the shoulders, getting these hands on the pelvis and hips and so on. Yeah. So um, which also shows a, a potentially challenge me on this kind of power. Um, so um, I had to... Somebody do a photo shoot of me. Um, I've got somebody who is a photographer and uses my studio. And um, when when we set it up, he asked me to to do that, and I said no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. You you refused to pose in contraposto. Correct. Yeah, and I decided instead to. Um, Stand like I just showed that men do, put my hands there and spread my legs and or else like that or whatever, just to so that I looked like a strong woman. Frontal. Exactly, frontal, not twisted. Yeah, or maybe a little twist, but not so. Anyway, I'm just saying what I was trying to do was challenge the stereotypes of what is perceived as sexy. So if you look at all of the magazines, they are changing a bit now where women are represented on the magazines like Vogue and all those ones. You'll see the contraposta all the time. But if you have a look, it's starting to change. There's a little bit more uh, variety, a little bit more differentiation in the way that the legs are represented Instead of all crossed over and sweet and ladylike, it's a little bit stronger, a little bit broader, which means you have more weight bearing control <laughs> and so on. So, what was your question? So, <laughs> Venus, Venus and, and Adonis, yes. which is a, a very interesting story because, like, Venus is the uber stereotype type about femininity and sexuality and attractiveness. So Shakespeare goes straight forward tackling that stereotype and actually depicting Venus as an actively desirous woman that, that not only sat there and waited for Adonis to come to her, but she actually like sneaked <laughs> in 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 intimacy with Adonis and she she was active like yeah like going beyond from of of this like dualistic or super binary idea to to many other possibilities for example it's often said that in between men gay that there can be a top and a bottom, but the bottom can be a power bottom. So it can be the receptive part playing an active role. And and then things are inverted. Or the typical image on most footage on internet that is the gay the, the guy receiving like oral pleasure and the guy is pra pra practically not, not doing anything but receiving pleasure <laughs> while someone else is providing that pleasure. So it's it's good to to go beyond the stereotypes and even go beyond archetypes and come into our own unique style. Like I I, I believe after, especially after reading Moshe Feldenkrais' Body and Mature Behavior, that a trait of, of maturity to me is uh, owning, owns singular way to delight, to, to delight in fleshly pleasure. Like you're like, Maybe today you want to be a power bottom. Maybe tomorrow you want to be a, a passive soaked lettuce bottom and not do anything and just like wait there for 
Adonis to come and ravish you just because you're beautiful, or maybe you want to to take an active like penetrative role or maybe you just want to be with yourself or maybe you want to be with the mush like the mushrooms that mushrooms are super super not even polygamous they are like and bacteria they are beyond from issues like I, I can't help but making like <laughs> a parenthesis here because I am a biologist that like we are a human species and there are elephants that those are another species And we have trees that those are another, depending upon trees, another species, and it's a plant, it's from another kingdom. But bacteria, like what we call bacteria, microorganisms, are all one single species. So there are no, no like kangaroos and dogs and, and giraffes, like all bacteria are just one species of bacteria because they all can mate with anyone with with any other bacteria like like the bacteria that lives in in the in the arctic regions minus 40 degrees celsius can mate with with a bacteria that lives in 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 a volcano and tolerates super high temperatures because they are interfertile so they can like have sex like bacterial sex and and create like a new variation of bacteria and that's like once we realize that our our human taboos have to fall apart because they are so limited <laughs> especially understanding that Like from a bio biological background, uh, the basis of evolution is bacteria, and then they had sex in more complex forms, and here we are animals. So all of this to say <laughs> that that is not not good to get in the way of of our physiological performance during the act of sex. Of course, it's in regards to other people and who you relate with, if you have one partner or 25 partners, or you are just you yourself alone, consent is, in, is fundamental. But yeah. at the very moment of, of the act, control is a bad thing. I mean, Unless it's consented. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I mean motor <clears throat> control. Yeah. Control of, yeah. of the other. And it's like if you want to tie someone up or be tied up or whatever, like, <laughs> you need consent. But at yeah. the moment of moving, if you try to do it, like now I am going to move the pelvis in eight counts and then two circles to the right and then I'm going to move my hair and do 45 circles to the left that is not such a a good idea according to to Moshe Feldenkrais in in a way that being too self-conscious and trying to perform well like willfully trying to do it to do the act in in any way can get in the way of reflexes to do their thing and so um, i think i think what he's saying is that um it's that just the standard in terms of what we say in film is that the, the habitual responses can can potentially in our body can potentially um uh limit the way that we can experience pleasure So he says that um, the, the quote, I'll just get the quote, he says that um, um, the um, there's a difference between um, excitement and pleasure. Wow. So, um, What a great quote. A surprisingly large number of people confuse excitement with pleasure. Excitement is an emotional state that can cause physical 
sensations, while pleasure is a physical sensation that can lead to an emotional state. Wow. Wow. Okay, so so there's there's that differentiation and that can that can potentially be um, the difference between just having the the game that you're playing and the excitement from that as opposed to the the very deep sensory input that pleasure can create an emotional state. So if your emotional state is anxiety, which he talks about in his book, Body and Ritual Behaviour, um, then that's going to retract the amount of pleasure that you can necessarily gain. And he talks about it even as a way of restricting orgasm, potentially. That, yeah. that um, because having habitual patterns can, can mean that certain muscles contain certain positioning or tonus, um, regardless of what you're doing. Um, Whereas orgasm uh, in, engages in voluntary reflexes. Yes, orgasm engages involuntarily, involuntary reflexes. And I feel this is key because it's something that, like, how, how to have sex is something that we know instinctively. Otherwise, like, we wouldn't be here if, I mean, like, because our great-grand-grand-grand-grandparents from 50,000 years ago, like, <laughs> they they found a way to do it without, there were, they weren't universities back then. And in university, <laughs> you don't learn that. I mean, actually, that's, that's the problem. The problem is not about learning how to have sex, but actually ha how to not get in the way of these motor reflexes of pleasure. And I feel that something that can get in the way and ruin everything, like ruin the, ruin the experience of pleasure, is precisely trying to fit into a stereotype, like, I am yeah. the woman here, and if I am the woman, I have to do this, and you are the man, yeah. and you have to do that. Or I am the woman here, and you are the woman too, and we are non-binary, but you're taking the active role or whatever. So, like, yeah. you can get stuck and framed into what becomes a, a cross-motivation, because you have yeah. the the physiological and evolutionary motivation of get your way and you have the cross motivation of wanting to comply with a stereotype which is something that was tied on on an early age to acceptance and maybe belonging like maybe it goes back on to pre-sexual moments like okay you're a girl or you're a boy and you have to behave this way yeah. or or you are a wife or you are or you are uh, I don't know the the active partner in this non-binary non-binary sexual affective setup or you are the the submissive and or the dominant of, of this this uh, combo and uh, don't get me wrong because I believe that fantasy plays an important role especially in arousal but if the fantasy doesn't get to the point of of fading away and becoming an embodiment and the pure experience of pleasure then Pleasure it can be bypassed and can be easily disguised by what Moshe wisely calls excitement. So this is brilliant. Like yes, excitement sensations as opposed to the embodiment of emotion. And emotion can restrict the physical 
sense, actually. Yeah. So it's a bit of a loop. And I just wanted to say, um, he also talked about the concept of self-image, just because you're talking about how we perceive ourselves. So we we act in, in accordance with our self-image. So I think I'm a this kind of woman, let's say. And that consists of sensing how I sense, feeling, that's my emotions, thinking, I'm not good enough or I'm better than you or whatever, and moving. So that all the elements that, that are um, uh, involved in how we perceive ourselves and we, when we are conscious of that, including the thinking, we can make that decision to change ourselves. So it may be that I'm always moving like this and then I realise I can move like this. It might be that simple, just like the actor that I was describing before. So um, there's many kind of aspects of it, but it's all about our self-image. And, and as you said earlier, it's imposed upon us how we're supposed to be. I mean, we we have representations of of ourselves in advertising and and stimulus all around us that makes us think we're not good enough. I have to purchase this dress, otherwise I'm not good enough. Or I have to purchase these shoes or I'm not cool enough to be seen as hot and so on. But but there, then there are other aspects of that. So there, that's the imposition, but we can make our decisions once we realise that. Yes. Then it's not an imposition, then it's a choice. Then it's a choice. Then it's delivered. Yeah. If you want to do the contraposto, right. you're doing it because you so decide to, because you choose to. Yeah. Or yeah. perhaps you find yourself in contraposto and you're enjoying it. So you say like, oh, I fall myself here, but it's 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 not a pose. It's a it's an action. Is it's a posture that it's assumed not to be a pose. And a fixed thing, but an expression of an action, action which then becomes yeah. action, as Moshe Feldenkrais said. And this is, and it might be that we do contraposto just because we're cooking at the stove and stirring the risotto, and somebody talks to us. That's a kind of contraposto too. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a natural contraposto. Or if your yeah. beloved holds you surprisingly, pulls your back leg and you twist and you end up like no <laughs> sorry you're gonna say what what does Moshe Feldenkrais say? What my aha Moshe Feldenkrais said something beautiful that intimacy it's a realm of gender equality and that that women play an active role in sexuality and even more so than men, and oftentimes even more so than men, he said. We have our own conspiracy theories that maybe he, he was just lazy and let, <laughs> let the girlfriend <laughs> do all the work. <laughs> but we know that he was also very active as an ex as a martial artist and etc. Yeah. But I I agree with that as as a fact going beyond stereotypes and even going beyond archetypes and just showing up on that piece of furniture that doesn't allow lies <laughs> like you you cannot really hide in the bed like you can sneak be under the bed but n n n nothing happens there but if you if you come to the meeting, to the encounter of the beloved, and you bring yourself forth, then, then it's a dance of, of delight. And it's a, a mutual, mutual sharing of and for pleasure. When we when all of this happens as Moshe, said, Moshe Feldenkrais said in the epic opening line of, of that chapter that says coitus is a pleasurable act so sex 
is a pleasurable act. Yeah. Unless our motor control, our, our own movement, muscular tensions, and and habitual ways of being and complying with stereotypes get in the way through tensions and and block the the instinctive reflexes of of sex and intimacy and i believe this this is greatly paired with the spontaneity in maturity spontaneity not not understood as just like like being mindless and reckless no i uh, i i want to to frame spontaneity as as an elegant ability uh spontaneity understood as the capacity to act without preparation nor hesitation in response to to the changing environment in response not in reaction so in response to the changing environment so it's you and your self image and yes you're acting on reflex but you're not acting in in a sneezing reflex out of distraction you you are you are letting this uh, primal expression of yourself of reflective movement to to take place And I, I think sneezing is a great example of a reflex. Like you sneeze and you have like a fraction of millisecond to maybe turn to a little to a side to the side and not not sneeze over the person that you have in front or, or <laughs> maybe to cover your nose. But it ha has happened to me that I want to block the sneeze and I end up with a neck cramp for three weeks. Like if you If you block the sneeze, you can. Uh, I believe that you can even break your spine. You can end up with an herniated disc because it's such a powerful and an instinctive reflex of survival. Like, if you don't sneeze when you have to sneeze, you can even die. It's like the same as vomiting. And I'm sorry to bring these horrible examples in the middle of something as beautiful as sex. <laughs> But sex has also this quality of of gutsy, of of uh, of of being really from the core and and from within, especially <laughs> in the in the moments of of orgasmic climax. And I can say through my experience that having detached. Um, Uh, a vertebral segment of the psoas muscle that the ones that are watching us can can see that I have a skeleton hanging and a little seg a segment of a very deep muscle detached. So if I sneeze in the wrong way or if I tense the wrong way when I am climaxing, practicing solo or whatever, during orgasm, I will end up with low back pain for days, like almost handicapped. So like I now I I cannot get in the way or I will know like I'm I'm going to pay the price but I believe that we all pay the price when we get in the way of, of our own pleasure and we we do this with the best of intentions we we want to to do the right thing we want to control the outcome we want to be successful often men want to prove their virility being like great lovers in bed but i i feel that this is in detriment of of the self image and it's in detriment of the experience of intimacy itself like you can get excitement and maybe even validation but at the price of pleasure and an example that i can see is of contradiction is like uh not not using the best of self in accordance to to the situation in front so for example having being out of control in your finances 
and being a mess in accounting and not paying the IRS and whatever, but being very controlled in bed. Like, <laughs> no, it should be the other way around. You should have control in your finances and in, in your deadlines in, at work and being able to let go of, of this motor control on intimacy and sex. Like, And I mean, not, not conscious control of... It's important that you are aware, but that you don't control the body movements. Or I mean, <laughs> so it's my complex, question, isn't it? yeah, yeah, complex. So that's my question. <laughs> how how you do that? For example, the the actor he he wants to get the applause. He surely doesn't want to get get tomatoes thrown at him in the theater <laughs> nor booed he wants to get the paycheck he wants to change lives or whatever on stage and the mere idea of failure or the even the mere idea of success and the applause and etc can get in the way of performance which would ultimately give him success so it's a, it's a matter of multitasking. It's a the matter actor, of multitasking. Wow. Yeah, the, the, the actor ne needs to stay immersed in themselves and have that kind of interrelationship with the external world. Not unlike having sex in the sense that um, it's not just about me, it's also about the other person. So it's not just about excitement because... The, both of the interactions about inter, about human connection. Okay, so um, um, when I'm acting on stage, I'm observant in the background. It's a bit different to sex, but I'm observant in the background about what people are doing. Somebody's phone goes off in the middle of the play. I'm not going to engage in that. I know it happened, but I'm still performing my yeah. role and doing what I'm required to do in that moment. I'm still looking after myself and I'm being this other person that I'm performing, I'm transforming myself into another person, but I'm still me and I'm keeping the external world. I know where the stage is. I know where the other performers are. I know where the audience is. Um and it's important, but I'm still present here. So I've got this interrelationship and I'm the primary source. I'm staying in me. It's similar in a sexual act, um, the difference between excitement and pleasure. Um, and I'm just going to go here about not, not just having power and control in that situation unless it's consensual. Um, um, but that kind of, uh, I'm present in me. I have the habits of anxiety potentially interfering with my pleasure and emotional state. If I can reduce those, uh, habits of stereotypes or anxiety and be present, then that human interaction is part of the interrelationship. Just like we talked about in a previous podcast, the importance of uh, touch and human contact is critical for the brain functioning in in a, in a uh, intelligent way. Um, it's the same in the sexual act that it's um, the interrelationship is. But it's a multitasking. I'm here and I'm also here. Multitasking. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, uh, Feldman Kreis raves on about it in, in his in his book, but you know, I'm not necessarily tugging or pulling. I'm, I might be gentle because I'm responsive to how that person is. Responding. Yes, and I'm responsive to how I'm responding. So there's the multitasking. Yes. But then, then there's this kind of clear connection 
human connection, that um, means that the act is not just excitement, but it's also emotional. You know, a friend comes up and hugs me, a friend, not a stranger, a friend, and I'm like, oh, that's nice. And I get this, you know, happy emotion. I get the, the chemicals in my brain that are, are highlighted, are called the happy chemicals, right? So um, I'll give you the list of the happy chemicals if you like, but um, as opposed to the stress chemicals that are highlighted. So that's what we're seeking, right? We want the chemical highlights to be the happy chemicals, and that's not going to occur so conveniently if we're holding the habits of how we should be. So even saying that, I could feel my stomach just gripping. Now I'm not going to say it anymore, and I notice that I can just be free. That means my <laughs> sexual act is going to be easier. It means my pelvis is going to move more conveniently. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we want that. that. We want that. Moves yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is a great perspective, multitasking. So it's like allowing many layers of awareness. Like yeah. you, you know in the background what's going on, but you are doing your thing. You you your fourth in in the situation. Um, but in an intimate act, it's foreground. Foreground, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we're still multitasking. It's me and them. Me and, yeah. So you're aware of your pleasure, the pleasure of the other, and the dance that it's made together. Yes. Exactly. And, exactly. And how to deal with shyness and inhibition and self-consciousness besides turning off the lights? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, hmm. Yeah, e e even if one feels like I am perfectly happy with my body just as it is today without wanting to change anything, or accepting to what I don't like, even then, like, stuff can creep in, like, yeah, like, is this person gonna leave me after he, this? Because th there's, there's a huge social stigma on expecting that, and expecting men to want sex and expecting women women to have to want love but what's what what about if it's the other way around like if we dare to think that men want love and women want sex and what if you want both and the other wants both as well but in the meantime like all of these Education, cultural conditioning can get in the way, um, not consciously, automatically. In the same way that it can get in the way for an actor or or anyone, like like maybe it had it has happened to me when I am when I have been given for the first time to a new group a uh, pilates teacher training like i'm i don't know if they are gonna like this and mm, my strict ways and crazy ways or if they're gonna hate me and leave a bad review so so in short my question is how to deal and agree with uncertainty because especially, especially, okay, there's, there's many, many answers. especially on intimacy, if it's a creative act, like you don't know what the next move it's gonna be, which which is exciting. 
Uh, I'm gonna, can I read you something from the book? Yeah, yes, please. And start with one of the many answers. <laughs> <laughs> the image of oneself losing face or an exaggerated wish to show off are extraneous ideas completely out of place in the present circumstances. He's talking about it within the sexual act. They are reinstated as part of an habitual pattern of doing. All the flexors are tense. Breathing is halted as in all states of anxiety. The sympathetic system is overexcited, hence the complete, incomplete and faltering, he's talking about men, erection. <laughs> the face is tense, the, claw, the jaws clench. The general flexor contraction is also found in the hands. The subject has to make a conscious effort to stroke or caress the partner. If he does, it's with a deliberate intention to excite the partner instead of the spontaneous tenderness. Yes. Therefore, his caresses are clumsy and uninspiring. <laughs> it's a bit of a caricature. It's a bit of a caricature. But um, look, just to answer your question, um, uh, uh, and I, I didn't really prepare a, a Feldenkrais lesson for today's session, but just to answer your question, the answer in that context and in many other contexts is pay attention to your breath. Pay attention to your breath. Even if... I want a tattoo here in my hand. <laughs> pay attention to your breath. Even if I just say that, I'm not saying to do anything with the breath, just pay attention to it, the breath will change. And but as soon as the breath changes, so for you and me even talking about it, I noticed that my my lungs are expanded, which means my diaphragm is expanding, which means that my stomach isn't clenching so easily, which means I have more freedom. More freedom. Yes. So it's about finding that place and it's this is relevant in so many contexts, not just in this context. Just um, take the moment to find your breath. Breath is so important and there are many, many modalities that talk about breath and how to do this and how to do that. But all I'm saying at this point is just, Feel the breath. And it's automatically calming. Yes. It automatically allows the flexors that he's talking about to to be a little longer, to release, to be free, which means that instead of the holding of the power or the anxiety or whatever it is, that it can be softer and sensual. For yourself, yes. as well as your interaction with the world. Yes, softer and sensual. So I'm an actor. I'm going, oh, my God, what if they don't like me? What if they give me a bad review? <coughs> and my stomach's gripping. <laughs> Sorry. If I remember to breathe, I can just be present and be in the world. Now, just because I just did it, <coughs> I've got a tickly throat. It happens every morning. I'm sorry. Um, could you just do a little cough <coughs> and feel where the belly moves when you do that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So can you push that part of your belly out like you coughed but you're not coughing? Yes. And then just release it. Okay. And what happens then? Everything releases. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. people think when they breathing that they only breathe here, but the breath is much deeper than that. It goes into the belly and into the chest. So let's just hold the clench the tummy and the chest gets rigid as well. So if you cough, 
which is not what I recommend you know, all the time, but do it without the cough. Just push the belly out and then let it release and feel that the chest will rise. That's just one tiny little strategy. <sighs> yeah. Like, hey, honey, let me cough and really... <laughs> yeah, but the thing is to remember your breath because if you sense your breath you're brought back to the present because like you cannot breathe in your imagination like you you are breathing as you speak and yeah. this is so simple that it's an elegant strategy like Come back to your breath. Just notice your breath. And it's like, like plunging into oneself, back into oneself, like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's about being present with yourself. Being present. Calming your nervous system and being able to engage differently in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And being present in a fleshly way, not not just in a concentration and mathematical yeah. way, but in yeah. in a sensitive way. And it, it gives the feeling of of uncertainty, not being threatening, but being actually a display of infinite possibilities. Which is That's nice. yeah. awesome. and yeah. we we need that uncertainty in order to be spontaneous. We need to be able to not know to not even know what we are gonna do next in order for that movement to be fresh and therefore pleasurable for for you and for the beloved or beloved that you are sharing with which brings me back to Moshe's quote on that if you are caressing your woman or your guy or whatever in an like intently and strategical way to please the person then that can get in the way and and come across as like mm, clumsy to say the least rather than when it's like a tender gesture, a warm and tender gesture. And ten tenderness in our day and era seems also, seems even also, I don't know, to my experience as something, re not even revolutionary, but Mm. not transgressive but something like super radical like and it it happens to me uh with the essential session podcast that people want to jump in right away to the conversation of sex and even in this episode that is about sex yes we're talking about sex but we are talking about what real sex is, according to Moshe Feldenkrais, which means a pleasurable act. And people freaked out and run away from the idea of tenderness and love and even pleasure. Can I say something else? It's a little bit of a digression. Yes, please. I can't find the quote, but um, <clears throat> I'm sure if I've said this before, but um, and I've asked my colleagues where the quote comes from, but there's so many scripts that we have yeah, from Um But he, he also said that um, if everybody would do this awareness through movement process, if everybody in the world would do this, there would be no war. It would be no war. That's about adrenaline. Versus the happy chem chemicals. It's about power and doing things without 
that kind of perception of the importance of the interaction with humanity. We perhaps shouldn't go too far into that, but <laughs> you get the idea. Yeah, definitely. You because just need to take breaths. <laughs> in a way, wars are... I, I, I have an hypothesis that people that want to get into conflict and want to get into war are people that want to prove their vir virility, even though you can be a woman that is looking for trouble. It's like like a way to cope with the inner sensation of disempowerment. And the over display of potency gives me also the idea that people want to prove that they have what they lack. So they make up for it in, in an external way. Mm. And yes, I, I believe that if people did the, the Feldenkrais method, Joseph Pilates did, said the same, but at the end they are, they are saying like, if, if we were all like more integrated, more, if we were more mature, like more self-referenced rather than other referenced in the negative way, then we, we, we would be able to relate instead of react and there wouldn't be wars. Yep. It's about relating instead of reacting. It's the reactive response that we're talking about. Yeah. Which gives you that excitement element, the adrenaline. Yes. But, but not there's some, you know. Yeah. I mean it's exciting to do bungee jumping, for example, but it's not pleasurable. Like to, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's exciting. I mean there's a reason we have we have these uh senses, but, uh, you know, we can make choices. We can make choices yeah. to delight. Yeah. Loving this, loving this. So shall we wrap, wrap up this episode? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. There's a lot more to say. We could go on and on. Yeah, for five hours more. <laughs> that we can chop into five different episodes so yeah. just as a nugget what what is another like good thing to to keep in mind or uh, a little exercise or something that we can use to to experience coitus and the act of sex as a pleasurable experience rather than a mere fleeting excitement that may lead to frustration afterwards. So like how how can we come to our fleshly experience so to welcome the pleasure in it? <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> Well, I, I am here with the master. How wouldn't I ask her? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so other than the breath, um, I guess I guess just as a nugget, another way would be to um, just take that moment to sense your whole shape. We call it body mapping. To know more about the work of Margaret Kay, visit www.feldenkrais.net.au and go follow her on Instagram at Margaret K. Feldenkrais. She posts such amazing dribbles and drawings with uh, 
a unique way to to connect with your body, mind, emotions, organization. And if you haven't already, go grab the free guide to Awaken Sensuality on my website at www.centraldepoder.com, which is www.centraldepoder.com. Until next time, remember to take the time to sense your fire so you can share your flame.